Welcome to our talk about implementing open source observability within MERSC. So you might ask yourself why are we showing bananas? So MERSC ships one in three of the bananas in the world. So if you eat one, three bananas, one of them is delivered by MERSC. And if you eat 10, it's three. If you eat 100, you'll get a tummy ache, I can promise you. So today we're gonna to talk about the observability challenges within MERSC, the MERSC observability platform, the read and write proxy we developed, and the work in, the work in progress. Um, so but within MERSC, uh, we have about uh, 300 plus engineers, and we try to give a lot of freedom uh, to them, but it has a downside. Every engineer, every team wants to have their own tools, which resulted in 10 different diff observability tools uh, within MERSC meaning that every team had their own tool, own, own way of querying, getting data, own contracts, own costs, et cetera, et cetera. So in the end, we didn't have any ownership. So like teams were reaching out to other teams, like, hey, I need observability, can I join your platform? Yeah, sure, here, here's the key. So that resulted in um, like a high cardinality because there were no standards. Um, there was no, like all the labels, people use different label, label values, which seen, meaning that it only increased the cardinality and in a lot, a lot of platforms like SaaS platforms that increased the price. So what resulted is that in the end, there were like a few big tools left, but not left like that were being used uh, and people were starting to get uh, gatekeep. So like there was no, uh, like no non-prod environments anymore. Uh, if you were not important enough, then we'd only have seven days of data, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then we come back to the labels and values is that like uh, nobody had a standard uh, in, in that part. Uh, so like what I already said, right? Like high increase in costs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so like if we add these three, there was no clear observability strategy within the company and uh, that's fine. And uh, so we needed something, uh, something to do about it. So what we developed was the uh, MERSC observability platform, or as we call it internally, MOP. Uh, it's built upon open source, and we use Grafana for dashboarding, Mimi for metrics, Lo uh, Grafana Loki for logs, Tempo for traces, and we also recently have uh, Faro, which is real user monitoring. And we built some in-house uh, tools around that ecosystem. So we have a read-write proxy, which we will talk about in this uh, presentation. We created an alerting solution. It's not about the alerting itself. We still use Grafana Managed Alerts, the Loki and Mimi ruler. It's more about the routing uh, and the on-call rotations that come with it. Uh, we use GoAlert below it and we provide a centralized UI where people can configure when to, uh, how do you say it? Uh, when to go to which channel. Technically, you can see there's an alert manager built for enterprises with a centralized uh, the uh, interface, and we also have some custom integrations from the company itself as modules. So for example, ServiceNow is one of those integrations. We also uh, build our own uh, synthetics uh, application, uh, which is based for API and e, uh, the user interface. Uh, our colleague Fikas uh, wrote a blog post about it, and we'll share the link at the end of the presentation. And as last is the Azure Metrics exporter that scales, uh, because there are a lot of Prometheus exporters out there um, for Azure, but it's mostly either for one team or one subscription. And in Maersk, we have a lot of subscriptions and a lot of teams. So uh, what we tried is much more of an opt-in approach. They add tags to uh, their resources within Azure, and we scan for those tags across the whole estate. And if you have those tags, we start scraping you. So a little bit of numbers of the platform. If we go from left to right, on the left, you can see what we ingest per second, the volume we ingest per second, the average size of the message, and uh, active series, so about 120 million active series, uh, Prometheus series uh, in memory. Uh, and this is still growing because uh, we launched the platform last year, November, so people are still moving. A uh, little bit more numbers, it's run on Azure AKS, it's all run on spot nodes, uh, it's run in a single tenant um, uh, configuration. We have about 11,000 CPUs and 40 terabytes of RAM in the platform. And this is the picture we're gonna to discuss today. So if you look from left to right, it's like how people get data out of the system. So using Grafana or the API. And on the right side, it's getting data into the system uh, via agents. So what happened is that um, 
like with the engineers, with a new platform, there come like new way of querying, new way of visualizing data, et cetera, et cetera. So there's change, and change is scary. So, and documentation examples can only get you so far. So we needed an interactive way of teaching engineers how to use the platform and also protect ourselves from what we call monster queries. So we introduced Wizard. So Wizard is the read proxy that we just uh, explained. And this is a, uh, like it sits between Grafana and the uh, clients that can use it via API. And it goes to the backend, which I just showed, which is Mimir, Loki, and Tempo. Uh, we also expose this as an external API endpoint, which people can then use for like just the CLI tools or different tools that need the uh, API. Uh, of, so, and these a the API we expose are just the native APIs that the, the backend uh, uses. But we also build in some protection. So uh, if people are aware how things are done, then you can bring down a system quite easily if you have a lot of data. So what we did is that, like for example, if you go from uh, left to right here, is that on the left side, we require people to provide a metric name if they query for metrics. If they query for metrics, we also ask that they at least ask, uh, add one label to the query. If they use wildcards, we ask them to use a one, like to add a non-wildcard to it just to make sure that we limit the amount of data we request. And on the last, last one is uh, Loki, where we expect at least two labels, and this is something that they recently developed themselves as well. And then we also get some insights from it, so we can see how dashboards are used, or the Grafana Managed Alerts, so we can either improve our documentation, reach out to people that say, hey, this query is not right, please try to fix it, or are you aware that stuff is not working? And this dashboard is also uh, shared within the, uh, uh, how do you say it, within the Grafana we have within a company. So a little bit of work, uh, work of progress. So the next step we're gonna take with the platform is that uh, we're gonna introduce Thanos to the mix. So what we try to do is that we will deploy Mimir across the world uh, just to isolate the data or to limit traffic that we send to the centralized one. But we, in Grafana, we would like to have just one data source for the users just to keep it simple. So what we're introducing is the Thanos query and its sidecars, uh, and then Thanos' the sidecar will just query Mimir uh, with the data it needs. For traces and logs, it's a little bit simpler uh, because we can do the merging within Wizard itself, our read proxy, uh, and that's uh, uh, all being worked on. Uh, so yeah, so this is about how we get data out of the system, but how do we get data into the system? That is a great question. I'm happy that I'm here to tell you about it. This is what we tell our customers, just send it. It has been very important for us to uh, that we are not the bottleneck when people want to use our platform. So we send, we say to them, just send it. There's, we, we actually still get a lot of requests about, hey, could you please onboard our application? Could you please approve it? Because that was the way that people are used to picking up tools and using them within the company. So this is nice and refreshing that we can just say, just send it. And how do we do that? Well, it's it's a hundred percent self service. Um, even dogs like self service, even though they they, they can't really manage it. Um, but that's really the key. It's the key to any platform: uh, observability, compute, database as a service. That's why clouds are so popular. It's self service. So we have opened up the platform for everyone to use in the company. But we also want standards. We we also have an opinion. Um, about both the data coming in and how to query it. So how do we merge those two realities that we want standards, but we also want a tool that people can just pick up and use? We put a guard at the front gate. And by the way, this is the uh, royal lifeguards of the uh, queen in Denmark. They um, stand in front of her, uh, the, the queen's palace, close to where the mask office is. If you're ever in Copenhagen, come by. It's, uh, it's, it's quite cool. The guard that we have put in front of the gates to our ingestion API, well, we, we call it guard. Uh, in this case, we just call it a write proxy. It implements uh, three APIs, uh, basically mimics the same APIs as Prometheus Remote Write, Otil Trace Receiver, and Loki Push, as those are the uh, tools that, that we use. So whoever sends the data uh, to us, if it's an agent or if it's a SDK or something, they don't see that they're talking to guard because we follow the same standards. It's the same API spec. 
What Guard allows us to do is to create rules that spans um, all data streams. So for example, we have rules that, for example, say you need a ENV uh, for environment label, you need that on all data streams, but we can also be more specific on a particular data stream, which we are, for example, on logs, because our logging backend is also opinionated in uh, which labels you should use, so we're very opinionated about you can only have these labels uh, if, if you're ingesting logs. So we do this with the labels, and labels are absolutely amazing. Um, made popular by Prometheus, I believe, and uh, the tools that we use piggyback on that idea. I guess they even use the same code, actually. Um, the the uh, benefits of the labels is that we can control retention because we're, we know that um, data will always have these labels. So we could, for example, say not only for example, we are doing it for production, we store uh, three months of data, for example, but for uh, all non non production environment um, it's a lower lower uh, it's a lower retention we can do usage tracking we can see top consumers because we also have a app or app id or product id so we, we know that it's there already we can track track cardinality so if a metric is blowing up and that happens occasionally that we can see who is sending this data and we know who to reach out to and over time we will also do traffic routing as charlie uh, was um, also um, showing in his graph that Guard can actually send the data to the cluster where we want it. So that's quite nice. Here's one example of uh, a, a YAML config that we run in Guard in our production environment. Um, there are these valid values for the uh, ENV label. Uh, if you come with another one, uh, well, I will tell you about that later. Um, we require both ENV and app um, for app, you can put whatever, but for ENV, it needs to be one of these values. So why are we so picky about uh, which values to put in here? If you've ever worked in any data or observability system, uh, I'm just going to show you this slide right here. Um, and, and this is even spelled correctly. I'm not even looking at things that are not spelled correctly. It can go in any direction. And imagine us trying to implement uh, retention rules based on this, right? Good luck. So what do we do with, with the data that does not follow our rules? We are very particular, we just drop it. We don't care um, because we have our guidelines, we have our rules and we are, we are very um, specific about that if the data does not follow those rules, we just drop it. Um, I would like to have a piece of paper on stage and like uh, fold it up and just uh, toss it, but I haven't. <laughs> so if your data is being dropped, this is again self-service. This is what our customers uh, see. We have a dashboard in our Grafana instance that is actually produced by Guard. So every time Guard drops data, it increments a small metric. Um, and people can come in here and they can see which data we are dropping. Um, if you know your product ID, you can scope for your product ID. You can also see the reason why we're dropping the data. Are you missing a label? Is it the wrong value inside of it? What's wrong? So this is very useful. So coming back to Charlie's questions, or rather the challenges that we had um, before starting building this thing, how are we doing? Are, are we? Are we? Uh, are we successful? <laughs> we ask us that every day. We ask our customers as well. Um, we have uh, over 30 days, uh, 2,300 users in our Grafana instance, which is rather nice. Our, su our support channels are used. We use GitHub discussions. This graph from GitHub is a bit wonky. <laughs> it doesn't dip. It's not like people are not asking questions anymore. It just looks that way. Um, and our alerting um, system which has something called scopes and teams is also rising. Um, and it was a great day when uh, people, uh, our customers in our support chat started answering each other questions. That was like where we just lean back and say, this is amazing. Uh, because again, open standards, everyone, you can just, just go and Google it. That's also some, something people have, have, have to learn. But we're, we're definitely not done yet. Um, about our work in progress, we are going to continue our journey to expand the scope of MERSC observability platform. Um, and a question to you, quick hands up. Any of the tools that you have seen here, would you consider 
like giving that a star or using it or contributing to it? Anyone? A few? All right, that's pretty cool. So that's what we're talking about and thinking about, but we don't want just to push it out there. We want to know if there's actually a community uh, there, but this is uh, quite promising. Edge observability, uh, and this is if there's someone out there who thinks observability is cool, then uh, this might be for you because we, we were also hiring, at least uh, in the near, near future. So edge observability is something that we uh, will be looking at. We have, uh, so what, what do we mean with edge? 700 plus vessels that uh, float the seas of the world. They have a, a Kubernetes cluster on them. They even run Prometheus, some of them. And uh, we want to standardize that as well. We have 60 plus terminals. That's where a, a container transitions from inland to ocean. So that's a thing in itself. They also need computers. They also need observability. It's very expensive if things go wrong in a terminal. And we have, have 400, 450 plus warehouse facilities. Uh, this is more like the logistics leg of, uh, of MASK. They also need observability. So that's some of the stuff that we have coming up. And uh, with that, just a, um, a quick thank you for joining. You can read the blog post that our colleague Vikas wrote about how he and his team implemented uh, a synthetics monitoring solution at MASK, which is absolutely awesome. Um, you can read that there. And uh, if we have anything else we want to share, we will just put it on that gist. And you could just uh, have a look at it afterwards. That's, uh, that's the talk. Thank you. <laughs>